Okay, so uh, a very good evening uh, to one and all. Um, I'm extremely delighted to welcome you to this fifth webinar that the Meyer College of Education has organized in its series of webinars, especially during the COVID-19 lockdown period when the colleges are uh, all, uh, you know, undergoing a transformation in terms of online education. Uh, and uh, to deliver our fifth webinar, we have amidst us uh, Associate Professor Gerardo Blanco uh, from the Lynch School of Education and Human Development, Boston College, Massachusetts, USA. Uh, I would like to welcome you, Professor Blanco, uh, to this webinar and thank you very much for giving your valuable time and connecting with our faculty and students. Uh, thank you very much. Right. So before I hand over the proceedings to Professor Blanco, I would just like to introduce him to our uh, students and faculty members. Uh, so Professor Blanco, apart from being uh, in the Lynch School of Business, uh, Education, sorry, uh, he's also the academic director in the Center for International Higher Education uh, at the Boston College. Uh, he's a prolific scholar with over 40 academic publications in one of the topmost journals uh, of higher education. And his area of, of specialization is also uh, in the field of quality of higher education and internationalization of education. And he's uh, one of the leading authorities in the area of comparative education. He is uh, also a visiting academic to a number of universities in China, Germany, and Poland. Uh, and apart from that, he has received numerous awards uh, like the best research paper award and the dissertation award. Uh, he has received numerous fellowships and grants to the tune of over 40,000 US dollars in the last few years uh, on various projects. Uh, he has made presentations in over 60 conferences and seminars and has been serving on the editorial board of top international journals in the field of higher education. So I'm extremely delighted to welcome you today and hope and believe that we have a very fruitful interaction. And since uh, the topic for your presentation uh, is uh, assuring quality in online teaching. Uh, I'm sure it is a very pertinent and important topic uh, considering current times and since we are all into online teaching, uh, it would be a good uh, webinar to attend and I hope that we all have a good interac interactive session. So I'll hand over the proceedings uh, to Professor Blanco. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that very, very kind introduction. I, I really uh, appreciate it. And um, I'm going to, in, in a moment, just begin sharing my screen. But uh, what I wanted to, to, to add to, to this kind introduction is just to say that, um, it's just to say that I hope uh, we will have a very interactive session that we um, you know, after after I present some initial remarks, that then we will be able to to have more of a conversation. I invite you to utilize the chat function on on Zoom. If you uh, if a pressing question comes up uh, throughout my presentation, so that we can go back to those comments and questions, right uh, as we as we go uh, and as we transition to the uh, question and answer portion of the of the webinar. Uh, but also at some point um, at the end, I will invite you to unmute your microphones and if you wish, you can ask your questions or you can type them live, whichever way you, you, you prefer. Um, it's really such a pleasure and, and I really want to emphasize how um, first and foremost, I'm very, very grateful to Professor Gopta for his very kind invitation to do this seminar uh, and for that very kind and generous introduction. Um, I am really uh, pleased to be with all of you and I hope uh, all of you are doing well uh, and, and, and also keeping safe. Uh, these have been challenging times, but also they provide us with significant mm -hmm. opportunities, right? And, and I think one of them is that perhaps if we didn't have this crisis at the moment, um, our, our interaction uh, wouldn't be happening right now. I think this crisis has also opened up many possibilities because we all are being affected by the same crisis. We also have this opportunity to connect with each other, 
um, in ways that perhaps long distance and travel that are currently um, um, not, not taking place as much, uh, well, then we are forced to imagine other ways of interacting with each other. Um, so really, I'll, uh, today I'll be talking about assuring quality in online teaching. And of course, um, there are many different aspects that we could emphasize. I certainly will be focusing on a few of these aspects, but it's such an expansive topic that we won't be able to cover everything. However, through the questions and our discussion at the end, we surely can um, explore other aspects that maybe I won't be covering uh, in, my, in my presentation today. So I want to give you a brief overview of my... I'll just request you to shift to the single screen mode. Uh, oh, yes, uh, apologies for that. Um, let, me, let me just write. Um, here we go. So is this better? Yeah, this is better. Oh, that's right. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so today I want us to focus on... Um, I want to focus on uh, first giving you an overview of my research and my, uh, the focus of, of my scholarship, because I think we will find some different areas of connection with today's topic. Thanks. I also would like to provide you with a brief overview of the impact that COVID-19 has had in the U.S. higher education system and some of the challenges that we continue to face uh, at the moment. Um, next, I would like to provide some implications for teaching and learning uh, based on this impact and based on the challenges that we, that we have faced, as well as um, what are some of the individual struggles, right? First and foremost, I want to talk to all of you as a colleague. We all are in the same situation, right? So uh, even though today I will be presenting some ideas and some research to all of you, um, I also have been challenged to turn my face-to-face -face courses into online instruction. Um, and even though I have some experience doing that, um, this has been a challenging time. Many of us um, are having limited work time um, and we have to be working from home, right? And because yeah. of different family obligations, um, this complicates the work that we do on a regular basis. Right. Um, then I want to present some ideas about the concept of quality, how um, I understand it and how that informs my work, but also some thoughts for going forward, right? And for thinking um, how we can make the most out of this challenging, um, very challenging situation. Me, um, but so as you can probably see, right, um, my, my background uh, is not in teaching and learning, uh, and it certainly is not in educational technology. I did have some training for my undergraduate degree, for my bachelor's, um, with uh, some focus on educational technology uh, and some focus on instruction. However, my areas of focus uh, for my graduate education and for my career as an academic have been focused on, um, on higher education, right, uh, on competitive and international education, as well as uh, quality and assessment, right? So certainly these different uh, topics are of, uh, of interest for, um, for the current crisis and for assuring quality in online instruction, but there is a slightly um, sideways, right? A, a slightly indirect connection with my um, primary areas of research and scholarship. Um, in addition to that, um, I think in the last few weeks, right, um, not only as we had to transition to online instruction, but also, um, and, and earlier in our conversation, we talked about uh, how even the fall semester is uncertain, certainly here in the U.S. Um, I really have been thinking about the different skills 
that I need to develop, right? That I need to remember, that I need to continue emphasizing, right? And continue learning about. And certainly online instruction has been at the top of my reading list, right? It has been my top priority in terms of retooling and developing new skills. Um, so I had to find some of my old files back from years ago when I studied my bachelor's degree and rereading some of those uh, some of those assigned readings, um, particularly in relation to instructional design. I will be sharing some of these findings, right? But also, in fact, um, reaching out to some of my current and past students, because the truth is that some students know quite a bit more about technology than I do. So I have developed my own panel of experts, uh, of past students, right, who are working in instructional design, who focus in online learning, and I have been reaching out to these uh, current and past students to ask them for their advice, right? They have recommended some readings, they have recommended different resources, and I will be sharing some of those um, with you. But I really wanted to emphasize that I'm coming to this topic from the perspective of comparative education, of the study of higher education with a focus on quality assurance, because my expertise, uh, other than being a practitioner, right, other than being a teacher myself, has not been in the study of teaching and learning. Uh, but I believe that with, um, as a good constructivist, I think together we can develop more learning than um, the knowledge that any of us individually may have. Yes, sure. But I want to shift gears for a second and talk about the current impact of COVID-19 in the United States. Um, and I will be very interested in seeing some of the similarities and differences that maybe you have encountered uh, in your day-to-day -day practice, right? But certainly for us in the United States, it was a time for sudden change and with very limited time for preparation. Um, I was talking with colleagues the other day and we normally have uh, what we call a spring break in March. And even though it's not the same for every university, uh, we normally begin the semester in January, and we know that um, there is a very fast pace, and then we have about a week, some universities have two weeks for spring break, um, and the challenge with this was that just as many of us were either getting ready for spring break, or when we were during uh, our scheduled spring breaks, our universities, um, made the decision to either ask students not to come back after spring break uh, or, um, or they were sending them off, asking them to get ready not to return after. And then all the faculty members, all the teaching staff, we were also asked to prepare a plan for continuing instruction. Um, so I really wanted to emphasize the spring break component because uh, many academics, uh, and I'm sure many of you do something like this, we plan our life in semesters, right? We plan our lives according to the cycles of the academic calendar, much more than the regular calendar, right? So we know when we can take time off, we know when we can take family obligations. And generally, this period of rest um, was turned into a very intensive period of preparation to develop these plans. Right. But also, and this is very important to, to emphasize, that existing inequalities were emphasized, right? And these inequities exist across universities, but also within universities, right? So for example, across universities, some larger institutions perhaps, uh, or institutions that were already ahead with online instruction, they had a lot of resources to provide to faculty. So they, they just, I mean, many universities have full-time experts who are constantly developing workshops and other training materials for the teaching staff 
to teach online, to try new technologies, to do all of that. Yeah. But other universities, other colleges don't have those kinds of resources. Yeah. In addition to that, within institutions, right, there are significant differences. So here in the U.S., many, uh, many members of the teaching staff, right, uh, some of us live closer to cities. Some other colleagues live in more rural areas where high-speed internet is not accessible. Right, so there there are some very significant um, differences, and I also want to emphasize the differences that exist um, based on you know our different identities and family commitments. Right, it has been very clear that our colleagues with young children, because schools have been closed, have had um, a much more demanding time. Right. Um, as, as you know, in the United States, we normally have very small nuclear families. Many of us live far away from parents or other family members who could provide support with child care. And this has also limited, right? And this, obviously, the impact is hardest in, uh, in women. And, and that has been a significant challenge, right? In addition to this, um, in the United States, we are facing a complicated political environment, right? Because um, this notion of globalization, right? We, are, uh, we, we tend to be uh, a country where people travel internationally and many of these, uh, many of these um, responses to the crisis have limited the entry of foreign nationals to the United States. Uh, this affects our international students in a very particular way. This, um, and it also impacts colleagues, right, who have different national origins as well, right? So all of these, um, all of these challenges are coming together. Um, so all of these aspects of the crisis, of course, have a significant impact on teaching and learning, right? right? Um, the other piece uh, is the long-term effect, right? So in the United States, um, as you probably have seen from uh, just following international news, the response was rather slow, right? Yeah. So we knew of the first cases or we knew... Uh, since the beginning of the spring semester, so around January, that yes. this crisis um, uh, was coming. And probably now, in retrospect, it seems obvious that we were going to be affected, right? That this was going to be a global crisis. Yeah. But for some reason at the moment, the urgency of this wasn't so evident from the beginning. Right. So in addition to all of these challenges, we had a very slow response in the United States. And this has complicated the situation for universities. Right. Um, and, and I really believe, as many other colleagues do, that unfortunately, the recovery, getting back to, to a sense of normal, um, is going, the timeline is going to be of years and not of weeks or months. Um, and I think this is an important conversation to have because the sooner we embrace that reality, the better we are going to be uh, positioned to, um, to respond to that and to plan for a future that is um, at the moment quite uncertain. Um, so what are the implications for teaching and learning? Um, and I really wanted to share with you uh, a couple of ideas in, in, in this regard. First, um, we have, I wanted to, to use this reference to, um, to a relatively recent uh, journal article uh, that indicates that for the most part, students tend to be less satisfied with those courses that they have taken online. And this study that, I'm, uh, and I have the reference uh, below here um, by a group of researchers, what they identified uh, is that they utilized a large survey, uh, but it really was based on observations of courses that had been converted over time. So this was, of course, before COVID-19, but courses that were initially 
face to face. So as you know, most colleges and universities collect student evaluations of courses. So they compared for each course that had been converted from face to face to online, the scores for the instructor and for the course before online and after online. And what they identified is that there was a modest drop, a modest but significant um, drop in the satisfaction of students, both about the instructor and about the course, right? So I really wanted to preface my comments by acknowledging this, right? And the other piece, and this is where the idea of quality really jumped at me. Uh, as Professor Gupta mentioned, you know, LinkedIn and other social media uh, platforms provide us with that space, right? Okay. To, to yeah. see what others are doing. And not surprisingly, it was in China where we first saw, right? They were the epicenter, the first outbreak of COVID-19. So they also had the first opportunity to respond to this crisis. Right. And the image that you see on the right side of this, um, of this uh, slide is exactly what caught my attention. Because, uh, and, and, and I have taught in China for a number of years during the summer, so I am somewhat familiar with the teaching and learning style of Chinese universities. Right. It tends yeah. to be a very traditional uh, sage on the stage uh, type of approach to teaching and learning, yeah. right? Um, that often causes some tension when I go and teach in my uh, seminar style, right? And students, um, the students try to be open, right, to the idea, but it's very evident that they are not so used to the discussion-based participatory approaches that we normally follow in the United States. Also in the US, I teach a number of international students, so I'm familiar with the difference in teaching and learning styles. But some of the images, as you can see, uh, were very uh, similar to what we are having, right? So we're having a webinar, but I really believe that webinars like what we are having are very effective for these kind of presentations. It's yeah. a limited interaction. We have a very clear topic that we are covering. Yeah. There is no doubt that we can have a presentation and do that effectively. Right. I think that works really well if we are having a conference, if we are having a symposium or an academic meeting of sorts. Yeah. It is very different for students, right? Um, this format doesn't work for all topics and for all students. But what I was noticing is this incredible massification right, uh, where hundreds of students, right, so, so this was a screenshot from LinkedIn of one of the universities that I, that I follow on LinkedIn. Uh, so it just happened to be Tsinghua University in Beijing, and they were having not only the regular students enrolled in the class, but uh, other students from other universities. So they had at some point 600 students joining this class. Oh. Um, and, and as you can see, they're calling them clone classes, right? So, and, and just the idea of cloning to me was very startling because I actually don't think we need to be doing more of the same, right? Which is what cloning may suggest, but we need much more individualized, more um, um, sort of customized approaches to teaching and learning. And this is my concern about quality in online teaching, that um, what, what I'm calling the lowest common denominator, right? Uh, my concern is that um, if we are not intentional in our discussions with each other, in sharing feedback with each other, that we could fall in a situation where the least effective teaching practices just get um, spread even faster and further in, um, in our practice, right? Um, teaching in an active style takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of preparation, but most importantly, it takes a lot of unlearning some of our old habits, 
right? We all tend to reproduce the way that we, the way that we were taught. And as a result of that, uh, lecturing continues to be one of the most frequently utilized approaches to teaching. Um, and there is nothing wrong uh, with lecturing. It's simply, um, I would suggest that um, uh, lecturing is very effective as a strategy under certain circumstances and with some topics, but that other approaches to teaching should be utilized in different settings. Uh, but what, what I began seeing, right, uh, very quickly from most um, Chinese universities was that the lecturing approach had just been moved to an online environment. And that's quite unfortunate, right, because there are even, uh, even in the platform that we're utilizing on Zoom, there are ways of making a presentation interactive right? There are ways for all of us to be utilizing, for instance, the chat function. Uh, we could unmute ourselves and interject and participate in class. There are different ways, right, that are not just uh, what I said, the sage on stage uh, approach where we just have one expert that shares information, right? Um, also, uh, as our students have told us, um, the um, many of our students are experiencing what we call Zoom fatigue, right? Um, being on, on, on conference calls or on video can require a lot of energy, right? Because we don't have the traditional interaction. So we need to be a little bit more expressive. And for some of us who are more extroverted, that's fine. But for introverts, that can be very tiring. So we can't just expect that students can sit in front of their computer all day long. The other piece that's important, uh, certainly in the United States, where we have very significant uh, economic inequalities, is that uh, many students are not having access to the technology or to the internet connection uh, but even if they do, right, so even if they can join a webinar over uh, their cell phones and utilize data, uh, what many of our students don't have is um, a private space at home where they can be attending classes without being interrupted, right, because um, because whether or not we want to accept it, in the United States there is a lot of invisible poverty Right, so some of our students won't have the kind of home environments that would be very, um, very helpful for online learning. And that's a reality that, that we are just beginning to, to discuss. So as you can see, all of this has implications for quality in online learning, right? The, the just transferring, transferring the uh, lecture to an online format I believe doesn't lead to good quality learning on the part of students. That's right. But also, and, and here I want to be very um, um, empathetic, right? We are all in the same situation. And, and my former colleague, uh, Robin Grenier at the University of Connecticut, uh, used this phrase that, I'm, that I really wanted to, to use in my presentation too, which is this idea of, doing what we could do with what we had from where we were, right? And this has been our reality, right? Um, frankly, and, and I, I want to be very open with all of you, um, during the last few months, many of us have experienced perhaps a lot of disappointment. Uh, sometimes disappointment on ourselves, sometimes disappointment in others. Uh, because um, if you are like me, um, I have felt that I could have done more, that maybe some of the strategies that I used were not the most effective or they did not work out the way I was uh, planning to. Um, and I think um, um, I, I, I wouldn't be alone by saying that I may have caught a corner or two during the last several weeks, right? That. Um, as a way of 
coping with the current crisis, right? Uh, we needed to make choices. And the choices that I have made um, that have been informed by my principles of practice as, as a faculty member has been, I have tried to emphasize student contact. So for example, um, I decided for some of my courses not to meet synchronously every time at the scheduled time for the reasons that I have shared with all of you. Students may be tired, students may be busy, right? In the United States, we face some even shortages of certain basic products. Um, getting even food in the grocery store was very complicated. So with all of that in mind, my response was, maybe an asynchronous online discussion, meaning the student logs in whenever they're available and they answer a series of discussion questions and there is a thread, that was the most, uh, the least challenging or the least demanding approach for some of our students. So my decision during that was requiring participation in that online forum, but not making required the um, the face-to-face, -face uh, well, the online interaction at the same time, the synchronous interaction. However, what I offered to my students was that if any of them wanted to meet with me and talk, we certainly could do that during the regular scheduled time of class. So making that optional and not required was one of the choices that I made for my courses. Uh, because my priority was to emphasize contact with students. I certainly wanted my students to feel supported, but I did not want them to feel overwhelmed by academic requirements. Um, and I also realized that this choice was the result of the emergency and that if we transition to the possibility of a fully online fall semester, um, the choices will have to be revisited, right? It will have to be different because then the students will be aware that that's what they're looking to do. Um, so here is what I'm describing as a potential perfect storm for quality. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm basing my argument on the reference that is cited at the bottom of this slide. Um, and it really focuses on the best practices for online teaching and learning. And some of the obstacles uh, that are listed here are what the authors identify as the obstacles to quality in online teaching and learning. And what they identify is a lack of support and rewards, unreliable technology, absent or poor technical support, absent or inadequate training, and workload concerns. So the argument that I'm making is that we are having this perfect storm for, um, for quality because these obstacles or these challenges are really the day-to-day -day for most um, members of the teaching staff, certainly in the United States. And I really want to focus on each of them because I think once we identify what the challenges are, then we can make some decisions, right, to, to turn these problems into potential opportunities. First of all, um, in the US, um, so, and I really want to emphasize, I'm speaking from the perspective of my day-to-day -day reality, right? What we are encountering here in the US. Um, first of all, uh, while there has been support for members of the, of the teaching staff, um, there certainly have not been rewards for, um, and this is an ongoing crisis. So let me just provide you a little bit of background for this. So in, by, by and large, colleges and universities in the US compensate um, members of the academic staff for, for nine months, right? So the salaries are calculated on a nine month basis uh, under the assumption that if you are not teaching in the summer, you are not what is considered under contract. 
we are heading to a situation where, of course, with the current economic crisis that we are encountering in the U.S., we are not um, we are not uh, in a position to compensate faculty members for the significant work in the summer months to prepare online courses, right? So that's one of the challenges, right? So some universities have come, on, come up with some mechanisms, for example, to be more lenient with the evaluation of faculty members in other aspects of our work particularly with research expectations, right? So I think that's a, that's a good and very effective decision, um, but it may not be sufficient to address the issue of support. Right. The second aspect, and I was referring to this earlier, uh, is that technology may be unreliable. You know, uh, our institutions, our universities and colleges may have some really good technology, right? Very good internet connection, um, on campus, but that doesn't translate, that doesn't mean that all of us have good internet connections at home. It doesn't also mean that we have access to um, well-maintained uh, and most modern uh, computers at home. Um, this doesn't account for the fact that many families uh, maybe, or that many faculty members may be sharing uh, electronic devices with family members. Right. Um, so our colleagues with children, for instance, are also doing online learning. So many colleagues are sharing their iPads and, and uh, computers with their children, right? right? And, and they need to be on a tight schedule. And, and this can be a significant challenge as well. The other piece uh, is that even those of us who work in universities that have very good technical support, our IT departments tend to be very strong, but many of them, most universities and colleges are overwhelmed by the number of requests received, right? And the other aspect is that um, the training component is very significant. Right, that some of us uh, are more or less comfortable with these online teaching platforms, but many of our colleagues haven't had an opportunity to teach online in the past. Not everybody is equally comfortable utilizing these online tools, right? Um, so here we encounter some significant challenges. And finally, um, as, as I mentioned with my comment about spring break, Many of us um, have been a little tired uh, from the regular demands of the semester, and then that was followed by using break um, to transform our courses online, and this really presents some significant challenges, right, as we are balancing other family obligations, other responsibilities. So I'm not trying to sound like I am complaining or voicing complaints from colleagues, I'm simply from the perspective, right, as an, as an educational researcher, identifying the challenges so that then we can try to identify some solutions, right? So what can we do? Um, I think one of the first steps would be for academic leaders to identify these challenges. And I realize that um, in the United States, we are having three different waves of a crisis, right? American colleges and universities are facing at least three different waves of this crisis. The first wave was the, uh, the outbreaks of COVID-19 themselves, right? That's an important challenge. There had to be an, a significant response almost right away um, figuring out what to do with students, right? So the decision by and large was uh, sending them home. Then they needed to provide support for international students who couldn't go home, but also even domestic students who are in situations that wouldn't allow them to go home, right? So unfortunately, some of our students face some significant challenges, they don't have supportive family environment, and that can be a problem. Then the second wave of this crisis is 
just about, or it's happening now, is playing out at the moment, which is many colleges and universities in the US and around the world depend on the tuition that, uh, the tuition fees that students pay, right? right? Even, uh, even public universities in the US collect tuition fees. And this is a significant concern at the moment. Most colleges and universities are looking at significant budget cuts at the moment because we are in an uncertain scenario. Uh, many universities and colleges in the US had to refund some of the revenue, right? So students had paid for the room and board to live and eat on campus. Uh, so the universities had to issue refunds for that. And that's a very expensive proposition. And in an environment where we don't know what will happen in the fall, most universities and colleges are facing shortages in their expected revenues, right? So this means we have a crisis, an economic crisis happening, not only in the general economy, but particularly within colleges and universities. Uh, and even though finance of higher education is not my area of expertise, we all have been learning about this topic and becoming aware of, of the significant challenges. And then the third wave of this crisis is what I'm describing as this um, uh, quality crisis, potentially. If we continue delivering um, instruction online, as you can see, uh, we need to address these challenges, the challenge of providing support and rewards for faculty members, uh, as, well as, um, as well as figuring out what to do to provide uh, technical support, but also adequate training for faculty members um, to, to provide the highest quality online instruction. Right, so these are the three waves that I'm identifying. There might be other aspects that I'm not including in my analysis, but I think these are um, these are the ones that we are facing currently. Right. So, what are some of the strategies? Right. So, again, it may not be up to us to provide solutions to these challenges. Right. Those are uh, generally up to our academic leaders. And if nothing else, I have learned that to be effective in my work, I need to trust the leadership of my colleagues. And if I'm in a position, or when I have been in a position of leadership, I need to trust that my colleagues will trust the decisions that I'm making. So I really want to emphasize this mutual trust, right? right? But what are the things that we can do as members of the academic staff to provide, um, to provide uh, better online instruction for our students? And I believe that that should be our main commitment, right? So first and foremost, we need to emphasize, right? We have multiple priorities uh, that are competing with each other. So first we need to emphasize contact between students and faculty, right? So even during the crisis, my priority was, I didn't make it required, but I was available to be in contact with students if they needed to, right? I think emphasizing, um, uh, contact with students will be very important as we go forward. And I realize that this can be a significant challenge um, for some, for those of us who teach larger courses, sure. right? Some of, the, some of uh, those of us who teach smaller courses, then the challenge uh, is not, is not as, as demanding. But this has to be one of the guiding principles um, that, that guide our work. Right. Uh, secondly, we need to find ways um, to promote collaboration among students, right? Um, this is an important aspect. Uh, we can't have models of teaching and learning that simply uh, center the, the professor, right? That center the teacher. 
we really need to emphasize cooperation and collaboration among students. Um, that is a central aspect of active learning, right? Uh, whenever possible, let's have assignments that encourage students to learn and discover on their own, rather than just relying on a lecturing approach. As I said, lecturing can be very effective under some circumstances, but not in all of those situations, right? So, so that's an, a very important aspect. But also, and I recognize this is a very high and demanding list, right? But providing feedback to students, Right, and maybe what we decide to do is that we identify some assignments that will receive a lot of feedback and others that won't. Um, we also need to encourage students to spend as much time as possible with the tasks that we have. We know that time on task is one of those aspects that really um, influence um, uh, that really influence the quality of learning of our students, right? So as I said, um, students need to engage meaningfully and effectively with the content. But also, right, we cannot communicate, right? So I earlier mentioned we need to be very flexible uh, and very accommodating. We can do that without signaling to the students that what they're doing by learning online is of lesser quality, right? Our expectations need to continue to be high for students, right? The students need to believe that what they're doing, um, that the time that they're spending is important for them, that they're learning something important and not just feeling uh, the time. Um, so, so that's an important uh, aspect as well. And then finally, we need to be open to the fact that students um, work in, and learn in different ways, right? That not everybody is the same and that the strategies that are effective for some students are not going to work for all of them. So before we wrap up, I really wanted to share with some of you uh, some strategies that I have been learning about um, and as you can see, I just wanted to briefly compare two different uh, sets of recommendations. I would encourage you, these are online, these are open resources, so I would encourage you to explore these um, within your own time. Um, I don't need to repeat this for you. Um, however, I did want to share, right, that um, that some of the rubrics, some of the resources available to, uh, to provide high quality instruction, um, there is this organization called Quality Matters, and they set some standards for online teaching, right? And, uh, and as you can see, um, these are very, very vague and very general guidelines but I would encourage you to explore them, to, to read them, right? And, to, and this is just a small sample of some of these uh, expectations, right? That they have identified that some of the best online courses, um, so, so these aspects are specifically related to the learning activities that are included in online courses. Um, and as you can see, um, a lot of this has to do with the instructors um, stating very clearly what the expectations and what the goals are. There is another set of, uh, of practices, right, of, of guidelines for online teaching that I wanted to share with all of you. Um, and these are developed by the California State University System. Um, and they were, by the way, uh, in the United States, one of the first group of universities to announce that their plan for the fall semester is to teach all of their courses online. Uh, but they're a very large public university system in California. And as you can see, they have already a robust infrastructure 
for online teaching. So for that reason, it was, it was easier for them to make this choice. Right. But they also have some very good resources and materials. They also are open. Um, so they call it quality learning and teaching. Uh, so the resources for, uh, for good quality online instruction are open and available. And I just wanted to share right, uh, some sam a sample also related to the instructional activities. Uh, and as you can see, a lot of these high quality practices have to do with the instructor, right, uh, sharing with the students uh, what their expectations are, what are the goals that we are trying to accomplish, but also trying to, um, trying to explain to the students how their learning is supposed to work, right? And this is an important aspect right because uh, it is our role to teach the students how they should be engaging with the different resources that um, with the different resources that we uh, that we provide them right so for example I, I I frequently tell my students that of course they should try to listen to what I'm saying but I also explain to them that I am not the most important source for their learning Right. right. I encourage them to do reading on their own, to use uh, and to access other learning resources. Right. And that's really important for me to emphasize um, that they I want them to become learners, not just consumers of what I say or what I share with them. Right. Ideally, I would like them to independently continue their learning after the course has concluded. And I think that's a very important um, lesson, right? Um, so finally, um, I, I, I want to be mindful of time. And most importantly, I want to arrive to the uh, question and answer portion of our presentation, right? Uh, so I really um, wanted to emphasize the, the one of um, the concepts that are called a colleagues, uh, Mary Elkin and Bjorn Stensacker, um, have developed. And it's this idea of what they call quality work. And what they say, right, and, and I think this is a very compelling argument, is that quality work in colleges and universities cannot be limited to the top administration. Of course, the top administration of a college of universe or university is interested in quality. It also cannot be limited to the um, to the outside experts, right? So whether that's a university grants commission or some other quality assurance uh, element at the national or government, um, provincial or state level, they also argue that quality work cannot be limited to the quality assurance sales that many colleges and universities have. Right, but that quality work has to be shared throughout the whole organization, and I really believe that the um, that the teaching staff is central to provide quality of instruction, quality of teaching and learning. But they also suggest that this idea of quality work needs to be motivated by rationales, not of um, just complying with rules. Complying with rules is necessary, but not sufficient. The rationale for this has to be balancing multiple expectations. And I really think COVID-19 is giving us a significant challenge. And we have many different priorities to balance. And, and that's simply the work that we need to do. That how we define quality is not static that the definition of quality has to be negotiated, but it also needs to be dynamic, meaning it needs to be open to change um, as, we, as we encounter different stages of, or different aspects of the current crisis. That our role has to be one of being problem solvers or innovators. This is not the time for obstructionism. Right? This is not the time 
for the agreement or uh, to be contrarian just for its own sake. Right. We need to support each other. And as I said, we really need to be innovative and creative. We need to be open-minded and we need to trust each other. We need to trust that um, our colleagues in leadership are doing the best that they can, but also our colleagues in leadership need to trust that we are doing the best that we can, right? This is not the time to get in, into petty arguments, yeah. right? This is the time to be generous and supportive of each other. Right. The logic behind this has to be pragmatism right we cannot be ideologically committed to any ideas of rigidity right we need to uh, change our notions of what constitutes rigor we need to be open to different perspectives and different ideas about a role within the college or university we need to be very we need to be problem solvers we need to be pragmatic because uh, our longer term ideological commitments, um, it doesn't mean that we're setting them aside. It just means we need to focus on the crisis, right? So um, this is not the time for um, rivalries in terms of, uh, as I said, uh, ideological alignments or of any kind. Also, we need to be open to very open-ended outcomes. Right? Maybe the way that students will show that they are learning will need to be different. Right? And then finally, um, and this is important for all of us, right? in terms of power and authority, right? uh, we all need to be able to make decisions for the areas that we control. Right, so just as I said, this is not the time for obstructionism. This isn't the time either for micromanaging, right? We need to exercise trust and support across the institution. Uh, and that's very important, right? So for example, we all have different structures with deans and department heads, and of course, different uh, heads of different areas. However, as faculty members, as members of the instructional staff, we need to be the experts, right? And we need to be trusted that we are making the best decisions that we can for our students. Right. So in conclusion, right, we are in a situation where the global is not only seen as risky, but as a source of risk. Right, and this is, these are uncertain times, these are challenging times, um, but also this is a time to think about what's going to be our international strategy going forward, because this crisis is teaching us that, um, that, we can, that, that, that there isn't a global phenomenon that doesn't affect us. We are in this together and we need to collaborate internationally. We also, this is not the time for competition. This is the time for collaboration. And that's a very important aspect, right? That we need to be open to collaborate within the university, across colleges and universities, but also across countries. Right. Finally, right, um, what some of our colleagues are calling this epistemic certainty. Um, and, and, and the simple way of saying that is that, you know, as academics, we are used to being experts mm -hmm. and we are not comfortable saying, I don't know, right? So we really, the new way to be in the college or university has to be one of epistemic humility. We need to be as experts, experts as we are, we need to be more comfortable saying, I don't know and also recognizing the limits of our knowledge and the limits of our expertise so yeah. that we can be open to other, to new ways, new and creative ways to be uh, in the university. And I really think this intellectual humility can go a long way in promoting cooperation, in promoting collaboration and support, because ultimately it is support for our students what brings us all together. So that being said, I want to conclude my remarks here. Uh, and I also uh, invite you to participate in uh, 
in any way that you can for our Q&A, our question and answer portion. Uh, thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, lovely interaction. It was really an eye-opening session in terms of uh, the challenges and uh, the strategies that could be recommended in improving the quality of online teaching and learning. And uh, I'm sure that uh, our students are buzzing with the questions. Our faculty members at the background have been um, collecting these uh, questions and uh, I'll request them to you know, ask these questions one at a time. Uh, so let me just start with our uh, uh, heads of the departments who have uh, had a time to, you know, collect these questions. So I'll request uh, Dr. Mulraj, um, followed by Dr. Ronika, and uh, then Dr. Monika Bajaj and Dr. Nishtha Rana to kindly ask these questions one at a time. Yeah, so I'm directly coming to the questions. Uh, these are somewhat related to the problems faced uh, during this uh, these online times. So, first question was related to uh, that uh, uh, there is a difference of non-availability of resources between university. So, how can we uh, overcome that uh, uh, non-availability of resources or the difference between them? Yeah. So, on the student side, right? Like this is really important, right? I think. Um, I, I tend to think uh, as a, in, in this current crisis, but also going forward, right? We really need to prioritize what is essential and what may be a good wish to have, right? So in, in the student learning, right? So think about what, what the students would learn um, and then identify which of those aspects are really essential for the student to learn from us in which of those aspects may be like what of that can the student continue that learning later on if we just really encourage them to right. learn right if we really emphasize the importance of that learning i think separating what's essential for uh, from what is not is a really important aspect yeah. secondly um the the question that we need to be asking ourselves frequently is can all of the students participate in this uh, way of teaching that I am planning, right? Um, so for example, if, if you use any kind of learning management system, and even if you don't, right? Maybe you decide to start um, a discussion online on WhatsApp, right? Or like, so what are some of the platforms that the students are already using? Right. that are not going to impose, right? And this is what I mean about, we need to rethink what rigor constitutes, right? In, in American colleges and universities, we tend to think of rigor as something that has somewhere the college or university logo on it, right? So this, you know, we normally have discussions through our official learning management systems. We tend to have this officialness to things. I think we need to set some of those aside and recognize that the students are using other platforms, yeah. right? So the students don't always have to come to us. We may need to go to the students at times. So in what ways are the students already interacting? And I'm suggesting that not so that we look like modern or that we are up to date with the latest trends, but that is what, this, what is not going to impose an additional burden on the student, right? So let's be creative and open and let's try to gather the support and the understanding of the academic leadership to say, I really believe that this is what the students are using and I would like to use that as a tool for learning. Right. Um, so that's just a suggestion, just one thought. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Yes, Dr. Ronika. Yes, sir. Uh, the next query is, uh, can we provide equal quality of education to each and every child up to the age of 14 years when we look into their uh, difference in socioeconomic background? Yeah, that's a big question, right? Like that's 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 a big question for our um, that goes beyond this group, right? Um, I I I'm a big believer 
that um, that the quality of education um, is not dependent on the initial resources, right? Um, so, so in other words, the input-based idea of quality is not one that I find satisfying. Right. I really believe that there are ways of providing high quality of education to large segments of the population, especially those who have not traditionally been served by our educational institutions. The challenge here, right, is recognizing that that good quality education may be different. Uh, so the, the, the good news of the crisis, if there is anyone, is that we are equalizing. Um, so in many places, right, so in the United States where I live and also in my home country of Mexico, um, distance education have often been seen as second best, right? Um, and now we all are forced to have some form of distance education, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, many years ago, uh, there were these places where children would go and undertake their studies uh, by television, yeah. right? This was before the, the widespread use of the internet. So these yeah. television schools uh, were really, because they, the students lived in very remote areas, so teachers couldn't get to those, mm -hmm. right? But that often was seen as almost like a second class instruction. I think the current crisis could serve as a democratizing, as an equalizing, uh, even though there are still significant differences, we can still uh, try to minimize those inequities and try to provide more equitable um, uh, conditions for all of our students. Right. So I just like to point out one thing that uh, you know when our students are in the class and uh, when they are you know attending a seminar or something in a face to face session they don't usually ask that many questions but I'm surprised today students have been you know just going away and they have such beautiful questions I really don't know if we have time to take all of them but you know they are really really interesting to the point and uh, I'm really happy that uh, students have, you know, probably these webinars have uh, not only done um, wonders to their knowledge, but also given them the ability to ask the right questions, yes. which in fact is a very good, uh, you know, quality that I've seen that students have developed uh, during the webinars. So I think so we can take the next question now. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, how can we cater to the individual differences in online classes? Yes, that's a, that's a great question, right? And um, the, the tempting, uh, efficient answer to this is, um, and, and, and I'm maybe I, I'm equally as guilty of, of these, right? Uh, you know, when we teach online, the um, our initial reaction tends to be one way, right? Um, I, I think we need to be open to the possibility that different, um, different students will learn or will cap, uh, ca catch uh, information in different ways or from different sources, right? So for example, uh, I probably, you probably noticed I used very few words uh, in some of my PowerPoint slides, and I used images. Yeah. And some of the images, right, um, I'll, I'll, uh, so I, I selected intentionally images that had like the masks, uh, or that they had the COVID-19 virus depiction in some way, right? Because we know from instructional design that images that elicit any kind of emotion will capture the, st the attention of our audience, right? So this is not about sensationalizing the crisis, uh, but really try, because we also don't want to be triggering, um, right? But we, we need to utilize images and text in ways, right, that, that will capture the attention of our students. Um, so really trying to use visual cues 
verbal cues, both spoken and in writing, is very important, right? So trying to do that is really, really uh, significant, I think. Um, but also, we need to listen to our students, right? So um, yes. I, I think trying to collect feedback in some way uh, at the end of a session, maybe after we have tried a couple of different strategies. Yeah. Um, so, so collecting this ongoing feedback from students would be really important as we, as we go forward because we need to be adapting and the situation is going to be changing in the next several months. Right. Thank you, Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Professor Blanco, uh, it was really a wonderful lecture. And uh, uh, one of the statements you made in this lecture that I want to make my students uh, independent learners, not consumers. So my question is related to this only. How can we make our students independent learners? Because it is the uh, need of uh, uh, higher education. Every teacher in higher education should make uh, his or her student as independent learner. So please suggest two things for this. Yeah, so I think for me, the biggest philosophical uh, principle that, that guides my teaching, my approach to teaching, right? Uh, so I wonder if this might resonate with uh, all of you, my colleagues here, is that teaching is the most noble profession because we constantly are working in making ourselves obsolete. Right? We, we work very hard every day to make ourselves useless over time, right? Mm -hmm. Not useless as individuals, right? But we need to, essentially in the beginning of the academic year or the semester, the students really need us, right? They need our knowledge, right? And, and eventually we are working very hard over the time that we have with our students so that they don't need us any longer. Right. right, they don't need um, us as individuals, right? And then a, a new group, a new set of students will need that support and that expertise. But in a way, that's quite the opposite, right? Than many other professions, right? Where you know a professional will always be needed. Um, so we are working toward our own obsolescence, uh, and part of that is demonstrating to the students examples that once we give them the biggest framework, right, the overall principles of the topic that we are teaching them, that they can learn on their own, right? right? That we, we provide them with the critical thinking skills so that they can discern what is trustworthy, credible information and what is not. Right. They, that's very difficult to do in the beginning. So, so that should be our main goal, our main task. And over time, uh, helping them identify their own resources. Um, that's why I see a lot of value, right, in, in, in the internet, but also that's a significant challenge. We know that there is a lot of false information being shared online. So the students need us to help determine what of that information is credible and what is not. Right, and so that they can develop their own decision-making processes. Now, how do we do that, right? I think sometimes just pointing students uh, or pointing our audiences in the direction without necessarily presenting the content, right? So a very small, very humble strategy in my presentation today was to mention these quality matters in these California state um, um, kind of guidelines for online instruction, but I didn't tell you about them very much, yeah. right? So, so if we do something like that with our students, right, especially with resources that are available online uh, to the public, hopefully the audience will go and continue that learning, right? Like that's a way of modeling that we don't need to be the source of that learning, uh, that we can just point the students in the general direction. I'm sure that that very small, very simple strategy could be translated to the different content areas that all of you teach. Right, thank you so much. Uh, this is an interesting question that I just saw in the chat. Uh, probably two of them, I'll, I'll just try to link them with each other. 
you know uh, it's very easy to see when students are in the classroom um you can you know make out from their faces what they doing in the class uh, but that's a big disadvantage that we have in the online system sometimes when students have not switched on their video so we actually don't know whether they are sleeping in the back of the screen or uh, they have even muted themselves so uh, somebody has asked a question that uh, how can we you know prevent uh, making online classes um, uh, in terms of converting our students as passive listeners and uh, somebody has also asked that how can we uh, get over the zoom fatigue um, so i mean probably passiveness and fatigue could be you know club together to have a answer from your side in this regard yeah i think i think if this was a class right rather than than um uh, a, a webinar um first we need to protect our classes from becoming webinars right yeah. so uh, i think for example one of the pieces is we need to to cut the content into smaller pieces is, right. and we need to provide opportunities to for the audience to respond response, right. so for example we could provide an introduction right so something i do and this is not always effective yeah. right so for example um we need to first point the students to the different tools right, right? so for instance um we could introduce the topic and then say um the, the way i normally begin my class um when it's face to face I always want to hear how the students are doing, right? right? And, and I normally get good feedback from students about it, right? So probably if this was a class, I would say, uh, okay, we are all going to use the chat function right. to write very briefly how our day is going, right? And I normally would want to keep track of everybody participating and I would myself participate as well, right? So I would also type exactly what I'm doing. Right. That, may be, that, that may not be the smoothest way of doing a presentation, right? Because there will be interruptions. I would need to say, uh, you know, I may need, want to call upon somebody to know that they haven't participated. But if the students know that, um, that this will happen several times during the class. Yeah, um, even if they switch off their camera, they are at least going to be a little more attentive, yeah. right? To to know that they're going that, that if they don't participate, I'm going to notice that. <laughs> right. um, so so maybe it's not the most elegant presentation style. There will be interruptions, but that's just how teaching happens, right? The teaching is not only a performance yeah. it's a little bit of that but it's messy and it's complicated uh -huh. and we need to embrace that also in online um right. teaching yeah thank you so much yeah so i think so we have some more questions uh, dr mulraj you have to unmute unmute yourself please Dr. Mulrush, I think you might be muted, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're muted. Uh, yeah. So uh, it is re regarding uh, the shift from face-to-face uh, uh, -face to entirely online, and it has been done in, you can say very in a very hurry. So uh, students are facing some difficulties in appearing for the examination. So how to prepare for those type of examination, and uh, what are various examination there which are to be you can say faced by the students yeah so this is probably my my uh weakest area of expertise right because uh, in in the us we don't have very much this examination based uh tradition we do in the schooling system right in in what we call the k through 12 system um and then there are the very high stakes um exams to enter university but once we are in college or university that happens le le less frequently um i mean i think here what i would say right is that if there is any possibility of offering flexibility to students um 
we we should make the most of those opportunities. I I'm realistic here that some assessments cannot be changed, right? If there is a paper uh, or or some kind of electronic based examination, there's nothing we can do about that, especially if those are required. Uh, and we are accountable to other authorities, right? So it's not always up to us. What I would say is if um, there is any flexibility, uh, we can use this current emergency. And let me, let me give you an example, right? Through one of the biggest uh, policy changes in the US this semester, um, you probably are familiar with the letter grading system, right? Students are normally evaluated on a scale from an A down to an F, yeah. right? Uh, and depending on the level, it's different. So for graduate school, if you get a C minus or lower, then that's not a, pay, a passing grade, right? If you get a D, anything be, be, uh, below a D is not a passing grade. Yeah. So most colleges and universities, from Ivy League institutions to public institutions to private throughout, almost everybody has implemented uh, for the spring semester a pass-fail assessment, oh. right? In other words, at the end of the course, um, and, and different institutions implemented it in different ways. So some universities, everybody shifted to pass or fail. Right. And in other universities, the student had uh, the possibility of requesting whether they wanted a letter grade or a pass or fail. Um, and because institutions are autonomous, we could make that decision, yeah. right? Um, and first it happened with undergraduate students and then our graduate students said, well, what about us? We're also affected by this. Can we get a pass fail option? And most institutions provided that opportunity. Right. I think that's an emergency measure, right? right. That's not a, a policy change. Uh, but I really feel proud that most of our colleges and universities were not concerned about what's the perception of this, right? And because everybody did it, everybody felt safer in making this choice. And I think it's a good choice, right? Uh, some students will still prefer to get a letter grade, especially those who were doing well, and they deserve to get an A. Yeah. But if the students were affected, right? Like I think it's okay to say for this semester, you either get a pass or a fail, and then that's, that's just for this time. Right. So you may need to find the own policy opportunities in your own context, but um, I think using this example would be useful. Right. The other piece, you, you, this also has impacted uh, academic staff. So academic staff in the US were evaluated, were normally hired on a probationary period that lasts about six years. Uh, and, and that's a big deal, right? Because if you don't get tenure and promotion to associate professor, uh, you can't continue working uh, at your institution. Right. Many colleges and universities throughout the US decided to grant an additional year okay. to faculty members in that probationary period, right? right? So the expectations about publication and, and so on got extended for everybody no questions asked for a year. So I think there are some examples, right, from even some of the best institutions in the country that suggest this is a time to be flexible and supportive because this is a big crisis that is affecting everybody. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I mean, in fact, the pass and fail are a good thing, but then the issue, you know, in since in India, when most of the things are dependent on your you know, the, the grade point averages which need to be calculated at the end yeah, of the semester or the year. Somehow probably conflict with that notion of that overall grade that we get at the end of the year. But probably uh, an average grade or something could be just given to the students just to make sure that everything works out at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. so we, do you have time for just maybe one or two more questions? Uh, so, Dr. Ronika? 
well, I have a question that uh, though we are moving towards the virtual learning system, so this question is uh, directly related to your experiences, sir. That what is the most common reason, as per your experience, that leads to dissatisfaction among students towards virtual learning, despite of all best practices and strategies used by the teachers? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think I think the interaction piece is the biggest issue, right? It's very difficult. Uh, we are social beings, right? We we want to be able within. Uh, within the cultural norms of our country, we need to be able to demonstrate caring for each other, right? Yeah. We need to be able to demonstrate that we are there for students, right? And these cultural norms may be different, right? So, uh, but, but there are things that we just cannot do online. Right. Uh, and that's a big, that's a big uh, problem, right? Like we can't, when a student is, uh, struggling or feeling bad, we can't give them a hug online, right? Yeah. We can't. Uh, we can't have that deep listening uh, and attention that we yeah. can do. Somewhere online. emotional touch is uh, lacking. Yes, that's right. Right, like we can't reach across the table, right, yeah. and just uh, like doing that contact physical contact is one True. of those uh, and even I mean um, and of course I know this is different across cultures right but um, uh, in, in the US cultural context right um, the gaze right being able to look somebody in the eye yeah. that's impossible to do uh, on on virtual because you know you either look at the camera or you look at the screen so you never look eyes and that causes a significant confusion <laughs> like uh, we, we don't know right like should I look at the camera should I look at the screen <laughs> we, we don't have that feedback directly from a face to face right and um, so even though we are moving in that direction I really think there will always be a component of, um, of face to face that will be needed I think we may delay it during the time of crisis, but eventually there is something meaningful and powerful about being together in, in physical space. Right, good. Yes, so uh, next question, please. Sir, well, as we all are experiencing that online classes are mainly focusing on cognitive development, but our aim of education is overall development of a child. So how is it possible with the online teaching? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, it may not be possible to the same extent, right? But I think we need to be able to demonstrate and to give specific feedback to our students about the impact. We, we know, for instance, uh, especially if we do email communication or online forums, students can be more blunt with their feedback then they would be face to face right so we probably all have seen um, these when we receive teaching evaluations from students when the students write comments about our instruction they can be more blunt than they would ever be face to face right. i think we could have intentional conversations with our students about the importance of empathy about the importance of being tuned with uh, the emotions of their fellow students, right? Uh, because this is a good opportunity to teach that also online, we observe norms of etiquette. We yeah. observe norms of behavior uh, that, that, um, that, in other words, there are, there are pro-social and anti-social behaviors even in online platforms, yeah. right? So we need to be able to, to encourage our students to use those pro-social behaviors also online. And then when we have the opportunity to go back to face-to-face, <clears throat> -face, then we need to also encourage that uh, but I also think this is an important education uh, outcome since we are spending more of our time online. Right. Thank you so much. So we'll have just one last question. Uh, I think since uh, she has a connectivity issue, okay. so we can have it that uh, one question is there that uh, 
uh, which platform uh, for teaching is uh, best in terms of quality parameters? What is your recommendation, sir? <laughs> My recommendation is <laughs> this platform is whatever you already have access to, right? I, I'm a big, really big believer, <clears throat> and, and I, this has been confirmed by many of my colleagues who are in instructional design. The number one, uh, right, the number one advice I have received about online teaching is do not let the technology drive your pedagogy, right? right? Don't let the medium determine how you teach right. right so let's figure out what we have available right because um this is the time where uh where we may feel oh i need to have this technology or that other one i would say right like um use what you have access to right like i'm i'm a big believer of just uh when i when i'm in a university or college learn what are the official tools that we already have, right? There's somebody who have made the decision to identify what uh, platforms, right, the university is using. And I just try to learn those. And if there is limited availability of those platforms, let's learn what are the students already using. And maybe we can use the uh, educational potential of those platforms. Uh, so the best the, the best technology is that uh, which you already have access to. Yeah, okay. right. <laughs> right. Thank you. So we are using a mix of Zoom and our main focus is on Google Classroom. So we also use that for student assignments and student tests and uh, other things that uh, you know we use in our day-to-day -day teaching. So we are using a mix of technologies, whatever is available. Yeah. That's right. And, and I think that's a really good, I mean, you can do a lot worse. I think, I think for these kind of interactions, Zoom is a, is a very useful, very powerful tool. I also think for the more asynchronous, right? So having a diverse, not just the instructor, I think Google, Google Classroom can also be a very powerful tool. Um, and because these are very widely utilized platforms, they can also be very useful for students, right? I think for them, for our students to learn how to use Zoom effectively, uh, it's also going to be very helpful, oh, yeah. right? Because that's what one of the technologies that almost everybody is using. Yeah. So if they learn how to do it effectively, how to feel confident, um, and frankly, how to even do a job interview over Zoom that is effective, right. um, we would be doing a, 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 a big service to them. Oh, yes. Great. So um, I would just like to thank you once again for giving your precious time to us. And thank you to all the students and faculty members for asking such wonderful questions. So on behalf of everybody from the entire Meyer family here in Jammu, India, we would like to thank you once again for connecting with us today and giving a wonderful webinar to our students. And we hope to connect in future as well. Uh, and so do I. Thank you so much for your kind invitation and I wish you all the very best. Please keep in touch and um, thank you. Thank you again and, and please take care. Thank you so much, you too. Thank you.